All right, well, are you ready to do it? So I'm assuming people can see me. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the final Learning Sciences Brown Bag of the semester and of the year, actually. Uh, uh, last but certainly not least, um, I'm Joshua Danish, uh, Chair of the Learning Sciences Program and uh, also a uh, member of CRLT and a collaborator of our speaker today, who I'm happy to introduce. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Kalani Craig, she is an associate clinical professor here in the IU History Department. She's also a co-director of the Institute for Digital Arts and Humanities. And welcome to Ida. I know most of you are <laughs> online or, or here in person, uh, as well as the um, associate director of the Medieval Studies Institute, uh, a member of the steering committee on the uh, American Historical Association with respect to digital uh, scholarship, and a member of the editorial board of the American Historical Review to mention just a few things. Uh, and as, if that wasn't enough, I decided to check with her son and say, what else should everybody know? And he promptly replied, and I quote, she's a poopy butt, end quote. <laughs> so now you know that. Uh, and if Connie hadn't got me a dollar, I wouldn't have shared it. But I win. Okay, fine, so I knew you, got, you got what you asked for. Uh, so, <laughs> Kalani has a bachelor's in English with a minor in history from Scripps College, uh, after which she went on to work in journalism and actually was working on one of the very first online uh, newspapers and really built up from there and, and through a number of other technical jobs, some of the technical skills that you'll see later. She then has a master's in history from Portland State uh, University. Uh, as well as a PhD in history, focusing on medieval history and, and digital approaches here at IU. Um, when she, so before coming to IU, she had uh, spent a lot of time in those technical spaces, learning um, all sorts of uh, techniques that you'll see in her work. Uh, and then once she came here, made uh, some connections with some of the truly most amazing collaborators uh, to help her do this work, including some very humble learning scientists. So you'll see uh, ideas about learning threaded through this research uh, above and beyond some of the technical and historical pieces. Um, she, uh, in her scholarship, connects three different strands. One is the digital tools, including text analysis and uh, network visualization, which you'll see today, as well as deep uh, traditional historical readings with a focus on uh, medieval Europe and how conflict transpires there, and also a, a long-standing interest in pedagogy and learning, uh, which is evidenced in a number of teaching awards and teaching innovation awards she's received over the years. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to bring up Lonnie to tell us how all these things come together in really cool ways. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate it. Uh, is everyone okay if I unmask for most of the time? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so first, thank you all for having me. Um, I appreciate very much the invitation. And as Joshua noted, I have a, a longstanding relationship with the learning sciences here. So this is very much home for me and I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that I'm on home ice, so to speak. Um, the, the work that I do is interdisciplinary and, and crosses many, many lines as a consequence of which I am not an expert at any of them. Many of you in the room are gonna be expert at some of the things that I talk about in far more uh, granular detail than I am. So what I'm, what I'm taking advantage of today and, and the fact that you are all friendly is the, the roots of a new paper that um, really draws on my skill set as a historian. Historians are interested in change and continuity over time. And the analog for that in the learning sciences is design-based research. The way is that we learn from one study, apply it to the next in a single strand of exploration. Um, and in this case, we're looking at network visualization and how we balance historical thinking and data science in, um, in, in undergraduate classrooms, or at least that's where I thought we were gonna start when we started this project. Um, as a consequence of which, as we go through all of the different phases of this project, I'm very much looking forward to the ways that your expertise can offer feedback and, and help us structure this paper. Um, and, and, and on that note, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the fun part. This is uh, a very, very small network. Note that it is not an activity triangle for a rare change. Um, the, the circles here are nouns. Uh, the lines between the nouns are verbs. Uh, and essentially, this is how network science functions. Um, things have interactions with other things and we can represent them in this form. And I'm gonna to switch to the really fun part. Let's see if I can get 
the computer to, to cooperate with me. This is um, the, the middle of the talk. This is minute 20 of the talk. So I'm skipping ahead a bit to show you what a classroom of undergraduates here in the history department did in uh, the before times, um, spring of 2019. This is the result of students entering one piece of information about one node and its connection or interaction with another node one by one over the course of two days worth of 75 minute classrooms. These uh, nodes, the larger ones have more connections. They are Claudius, Agrippina and Nero. And the information in this network was drawn from the life of two Roman emperors, Claudius and Nero. Nero is famous for burning down Rome and walking away from it as it was burning. Uh, so it's a fun story written by a gentleman named Tacitus in the second century. Um, and what students did once they entered nodes and edges was, and I've got to use the right mouse here, was play with stuff. They did exactly what I am doing. After they entered all of these nodes and edges, they played with network gravity to try and figure out who's important. One of the key pieces of historical thinking is identifying significant detail in larger context. Okay. Um, as a, a, someone who's been through the PhD grinder in history, I know that one of the things that makes me good at my job is that I have taken years and years and years and years to build up what we call in history a master narrative. The story of history, it's, it's change and continuity over time and how the, the broad view of the story of how history has unfolded lets me fit small details like who Claudius is into a larger context, the late Roman imperial world and how Roman imperial families struggled with each other for control of second century Rome. Students don't have that in undergraduate classrooms. They come to us from many different disciplines. They don't always have that narrative in their heads. And so how we, we, we bridge the gap between them seeing a detail and understanding whether or not it's significant because they don't have the big context is a real struggle for us. But detail in context is one of the things that is also a part of the learning sciences. How do we understand one student's learning in a larger activity system? That's the analog that I want you to keep in, in your mind today as we think about understanding detail and context. So um, let's explore this network just a little bit and, and look at some of the things that make it up. Um, we have nodes, these are the things. So there are events, people, uh, students took notes about who they are. Act A is a free woman that Nero had an affair with. We have an edges table. So these are all of the tiny little details that in aggregate are shown in this visualization down below. Um, Claudius sends a written communication to Crispinus. It is in Tacitus's book 11, line one. So we've got citational practices that let other students find the references students are making. And um, we also have gravitational pull. As a node gets bigger, as it has more interactions with other people, it, it exerts gravity on the smaller nodes around it that are not connected to other bigger nodes. So we can see now some of the larger significant nodes. We can also see the nodes to which those nodes are connected that have a role to play in the story of the Roman Empire, but maybe not right now, like the Senate, the Senate, which sits in the middle and which is the sort of body we think of as the most important in the Roman Republic. We're in the imperial world now, and we're beginning to see, and again, this is all student-generated data, we're beginning to see the story of the Roman imperial senate diminish in importance. Okay, now here's the cool part. The students had not read any of this when they started the 70, this 150-minute exercise. So what we were able to develop was an activity system with a scaffolded network uh, analysis software package that lets students engage with detail in context without ever having encountered the text before. So now I'm going to try and switch back to PowerPoint and probably fail because that's what always happens to me when I try and switch between screens. Um, hello, I am a computer user. Um, because I want to go through the ways in which we were able to build this activity system um, and how we were able to draw on all of these different disciplinary norms um, to, to put together something that functioned to help students think about the complexities of historical detailed context. Um, so first principles, right? A roadmap of what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna look at some of the precursors to the system. Um, and I quote, flailing in and out of classrooms because that's really what it was in those early days. Um, phase one, where we had a network tool, but not the visualizations, because there are some important things that we learned in terms of the design-based research practice that I'm gonna outline for us today um, from it, working with students 
who had access to network thinking, but not the network visualization. Uh, phase two, a couple of studies that we did with the NetCreate tool itself and the live visualization that comes from many different students across an entire classroom entering details simultaneously and being able to see the details other students are introducing into the network at the same time as the network builds out. And then phase three, because what, I, what came out of this that was unexpected is that the work we did with students changed the work I do with researchers. And I think that that's a story that um, we don't often tell. Right? It's all, always about how we take our research into classrooms and very rarely about how the classroom research we do comes back into our own work, at least in history. Um, there are a couple of, sir, not appearing in this paper today. Um, there are a couple of, of pieces on engagement that, um, that one of your colleagues here, Megan Humberg, has been instrumental in meeting that I'm not going to talk about. There's some data science learning principles that I'm not going to talk about because what I want to focus on are the three things on the right. I want to talk about CAPTA. The idea of data it comes from the Latin word to give. Um, and we literally think of data as something that exists out there in the world. Many network analysis pack, uh, explorations of um, relationships between people are drawn from social media data that's downloaded, pre-structured by the social media firm. Think about all your Facebook interactions over the last couple of years. We can download that and just use it. But that's given to us. It obscures the interpretive value of what we choose to download what a noun is, what a thing in a network is, and how it interacts with other things in the network. So in the world of digital humanities, Johanna Drucker has introduced a concept called CAPTA, things that are taken, evaluated, interpreted, and then structured and analyzed. So CAPTA is really the tie here between the world of history and the world of data science. And it's gonna be the thread that I pull on as we talk about how we're using all of this technology. I also wanna talk about computer supported uh, collaborative learning, um, which is Cindy Mello Silver's uh, specialty and what she brought to the NetCreate team, because it's what allowed us to take the big lecture hall, where in history we just talk at you for like 75 minutes and it's names and dates and faces, one damn thing after another, the sort of traditional description um, from a 1960s Time magazine article about what history is, but that's not what history is. It's just that's what's possible when you're talking to 150 people in stadium seating. So rather than seeing that as something to overcome, what we looked at with computer-supported collaborative learning was how do we use that as an advantage? The advantage for us was that we could divide a very large text into small pieces, give small groups of students one of those pieces, but each small group got a different piece. So that as a whole, we were actually working with the whole text all at once. Small groups, big classroom, advantage suddenly. And the third piece that I'm gonna talk about today is the activity theory piece of so this. is Joshua Danish's piece. Um, I, sort of vaguely use activity theory. I sort of mediator wrongly today in a, a meeting with Lena and then she glared at me and raised an eyebrow. Um, but it has been really instrumental thinking about activity theory, not as an analytical tool, but as a design tool, because it lets me bring all variables in a classroom down into bits and pieces that interact with each other. And I can see them and what, and what happens if I change one and where it will have cascading effects. So that has really been a, a, a key piece of my design focus as I make activities that then other people who actually know what they're doing with activity theory can help analyze. So the, the, the ways in which the mediating tools like NetCreate, the classroom shape itself, the small groups that we break people into, and how that all comes together in an activity system is the thread that helps us understand the changes between each of these phases. Um, which leads us to the obligatory activity triangle. So now we do have a triangle. That's an activity. This is the first activity triangle that we built when we were building the NetCreate grant. Um, and what I want you to look at are the different colors. So we have the students whose object usually is to get a good grade in the class by memorizing things. But that's not what we want them to do as historians. Our object as history teachers is different. We want them to use contextualized detail in historical argumentation. That's our disciplinary norm. How do we get an activity system that gets students to engage with that as a disciplinary norm, as an object of their lesson, rather than memorizing things. So all of these bits and pieces that talk about historians' disciplinary norms. We want students to cite pages in historical sources. You saw that with the 11.01 in Tacitus. We want students to document the historical context of a primary source. Who was Tacitus? What did he care about? Not women, as it turns out. Not a big fan of women. Um, what kinds of things are we pulling from network analysis and visualization that help us transition these disciplinary norms into something students can use in arguments about change and continuity over time. We can use peer revision of an addition to 
a network to help them see what other people are pulling from and interpreting in a historical text. So the activity system here lets us build out rules, think about what the activity in the classroom is gonna be like, and then build a couple of specific network visualization software features that allow us to support those rules and the student activities within. For instance, we know that if we've got a classroom of 150 people, divided into groups, and they're all using the same text, we need some sort of simultaneous data entry that is managed so that they're not referring to Joshua Danish as Dr. Danish, Mr. Danish, Joshua, Josh, for people who haven't met him yet and don't realize that Joshua is his preferred moniker. All of those people in a data set are different, but we know qualitatively that they are not. And so we have to control for simultaneous data entry. This helped us structure simultaneous data entry simultaneous visualization of all of that data entry so that each of the details contributed to the aggregate visualization and a way to make all of that context salient so they could see all of the individual aggregate notes plus the citations and argue with their peers about whether or not they were right. But that took some doing. So um, I've sort of hinted at some of the design of the, the activities. This is an overall activity design structure. Most of these classrooms are seven, 75 to 100 students. Most of these classrooms, we divided students um, into groups of three to five to tackle a 250 page text in page excerpts of two to five pages. And most of these classrooms, we did two days worth of tool based activities, one where the students were encountering uh, two to five pages of, of large text for the first time and pulling new data out, and one where they got a different excerpt from the text that they had already encountered and had to edit and revise the entries their peers had done on day one. Most of the methods, again, for all of the studies you're about to see included video data so that we could analyze and code for network thinking and historical thinking, and so that we could do interaction analysis on select video clips. Um, we use log files, so we have Google Analytics running so we can see what people click on, what nodes are they interested in, are they popping down the node or edge table to look at the, the detailed data, or are they looking at the aggregate visualization? Um, node and edge revision logs so that we can see what got changed. Um, and then student responses. So we also have instructor assigned things that came back to us with instructor assigned grades, which is great for norming with a historian who's not me. The very important part of that cross-disciplinary uh, dialogue that makes this study really valuable, not just for the study itself, but for practices here in the IU history department. Um, and then we used research team network and historical thinking codes assigned to those papers so that we could sort of normalize what we were getting from a colleague who's not an expert in network analysis, but is an, an expert in Tacitus, alongside the kinds of historical thinking that a team trained to do both history and network analysis would look at. So as we go through all of these different phases, these are the sorts of, uh, of, of underlying things that, that went into the work that we did. And so then on that note, we'll go from this middle ground, the phase two design and methods and the activity triangle all the way back to the beginning because I'm a historian and that's what we do. And it starts with Latin words. This is my very first exploration into network analysis. I was interested in how um, writers of saints lives used similar phrases with different wording. They don't always have the text in front of them, so they don't always quote. I needed to find tropes, common things that happen in conflict resolution. And my way of doing it was to look at how often words talk to each other in a sentence and use them as the things and the relationships in a network. And what I learned from this with respect to classroom design is that I did not want to use any of the existing network analysis tools that are out there in my classroom because they're so hard. They're just difficult. They're not meant for data entry. They're meant for data ingestion. They're not meant for students to look at. They're meant for experts to use. So that was a big problem, right? Because part of my job here is to get students interested in digital humanities. How? Google Forms. I went all the way to the other end of the simplicity line and said, all right, so enter a node, talk about its relationship, enter a target, something that the, the source and target are the terms for a thing that connects to another thing in network analysis terms. Um, and, and I tried it in a classroom and it was great, but you know, we ran into that Joshua Danish, Josh, Dr. Danish, Mr. Danish thing. Um, you can see um, in this exploration of a bubonic plague outbreak in Honolulu that the Board of Health, which contains doctors Emerson, Day, and Wood, are in one, two, three, four, <coughs> five places. So normalizing this data set to make a visualization out of it took me a week. Not effective. Except that I could show students what they had input. It's just that there was this huge lag. 
So it didn't make as much sense to them. Which brought me back to another research project that I'm involved in. This is Dr. Arlene Diaz, who is looking at how spies affect public perceptions of the war um, of Cuban independence in 1895. She was using network analysis too. She had a research team with many people trying to input data into a single network. So I did what any good self-serving historian would do and I built a web app. <laughs> Don't do this. Um, but it worked really well for what we needed because she only had three people. Um, I put together a web app that let her put people in so the research team could work from anywhere because it's web-based. As soon as they put someone in, it would show up for someone else on the research team as long as they hit the reload button every time they came to the list of nodes or edges they wanted to work with so that they could document what they were doing as a group on a corpus of texts that have to do with spies in Cuba. And it was great, except reloading a page is not a good way to manage data. People forget. Um, it helps with ambiguity, but, but this still didn't give us visualization. One of the things that I was realizing as we used that like viz that took me a week to build is that it really helps students see detail in context in ways that just text doesn't because they're already grappling with a 250 page text. We need to give them another way in, in addition to the text. So closer, but still not quite there. And then there was PDM. So yet another research study, also in a classroom on the Black Death, in a classroom where we, had, we did a pilot of network analysis using that reload tool, that web app tool. This was my attempt to get students to participate in argumentation so that I could do the, the equivalent of a six-person seminar with writing feedback, but in a 100-person classroom. PDL, these this poster here that asks, what's your hypothesis? What evidence do you have or not have? And what are you gonna do next? These poster paper pieces are this big. And this was the sort of line in the sand for me between well, visualization would be nice to have and we've got to have it because I could see what they were working on from <coughs> far away and help scaffold that. So all of these different strands came together to help me understand what it meant to do contingent support and what it meant to see students working at their own project level and then drawing on, because we literally have video of one of the students at this table looking behind them at another table's PBL and saying, oh my God, that's a really good idea. I'm gonna steal that. How do we support that with network analysis? So now we're gonna go back to phase one. I mean, these are all the precursors. Phase one is, is the initial study that asks how we can use that large lecture classroom as an advantage using the web app. And I've got a couple of things in that activity theory triangle where we can really think through the ways in which the activity system was shaped, right? We have scaffolding citation norms by entering nodes and edges. The edges, the interactions all have to have a, a page number from a secondary source, this is a historian's tale of an outbreak of bubonic plague in 1899 and 1900 in Honolulu so that the students can find the sources, find the page numbers they're working with on day one, and then on day two, come back and find where their peers got their data from and adjust it, critique it, qualitatively identify what they do and don't agree with. So we've got community involved suddenly in a very meaningful way. We also have, so we've got these nice citations here in this version of it, we have a, a way of managing data so that we can find things easily. These are the historical agents that they forget. Who's this person? I don't know, never read about it. Who's this person? I don't know, let me go look at the notes table and I will look at the notes someone took, which gives us notes. So we're forcing them to think about what they're writing, not just like taking something out of a source and documenting it. They're having to qualitatively assess what it is. And what we got were some re pretty reasonable results. So I'm gonna walk through this slide bit by bit. Um, the first thing that I wanna highlight is the traditional student, let's not do anything we don't have to. All right, let's not enter anything new. Let's just find where someone is already included. This is terrible, except, A student then quotes from the book they went to read after saying, I don't want to do anything. They go do something. 
We could use that. They are drawing on something that was done at another table in another group to scaffold their own work. They, not, they don't just do something, they pull on something somebody else did and use it usefully. I don't know what the word matron means. Oh, these are women. Women guards guarding women in quarantine. So now we have a basic understanding of what's happening in a quarantine scene of women being taken out of their homes and put into a quarantine camp. But the Board of Health that I pointed out earlier being thoughtful enough to give them women guards. These students suddenly understand something they did not at the top. And it starts with them not wanting to do extra work. Great, we've also taken the standard of undergrads not wanting to do something for themselves and repurposed it. Love it. Okay, but it didn't quite do what we wanted to, which is what this over here. So one of the things that we coded for in this study was to look at whether or not their conversation was a basic identification. I would label this basic identification here. Whether or not the network tool supported that basic identification. So these are all the instances in which the network tool scaffolded basic ID. And we wanted them really to move to complex historical interpretation. Why did the Board of Health not think about giving women extra guards? Okay, well, we didn't quite get there. So we redesigned the study. Phase two, live visualization. Because what we think is happening is that they're only being presented with text. And by pushing them a little bit with the live visualization, we can push them to see contextualized historical data and look at easily viewed relationships more effectively in order to synthesize them. The synthesis, the combination of all these things into an article. That's really what we want. So here's the NetCreate interface the first time around. We added predictive text to control for and give them some push when they said, oh, I don't want to identify anyone. Okay, type in two letters and find the person that you don't want to identify. How do we push that like laziness just a little bit further? But also, this makes the data less ambiguous. How do we get them to see things. We added a significance field. The previous version had a notes field. Not enough. We want them to tie this to historical significance explicitly, so we renamed it and forced it. Great. Now they're actually bringing a, a, a sense of historical understanding to the activity and not just basic ID. Um, how do we get them to synthesize? Well, they're looking at the synthesis in the visualization itself, which is happening live as they enter data. So instead of having the data entry separated from the visualization and its context, they can see it side by side live. This node, this Alexander node actually got so big that it started to bubble over the edges, um, which is part of the decision we made to change sources in the next one because we wanted something that was a more complex relationship structure that it didn't just depend on one person. But they could, like one of the comments that we have on video is like, oh my God, Alexander is getting so big. Is there anybody else important in this? And the answer for Plutarch who wrote this source is no, Alexander is it, right? They actually got uh, uh, the, the sense of what the author intended from the network precisely because of how the network resizes notes as data entry happens. Fantastic. So this was the full study then. How do we put this pilot study into a classroom and bring all of these things together, the detail and the context, the active learning versus the lecture, and the memorization versus synthesis. Detail and context. This is another classroom after the pilot study, and now we're working with a text that has, that I showed you at the beginning, Claudius, Agrippina, and Nero as the primary triad, the three big nodes, but lots and lots of complex interactions between them and their retinues. And how did students do with it? Okay, Claudius, this is from a, a transcript. Claudius doesn't seem to have much information about figures adjacent to the emperors or their family. Like you see all these little bubbles here, but they aren't linked to anyone else. The nascent historical argumentation of who are these people that don't connect to anyone but Claudius? Again, they have never read this text. This is what they're saying in the first encounter with a few pages. As they look at just their little few page excerpt and try and figure out what's happening to the people in it in other people's excerpts. The visualization makes detail and context much, much, much more readily legible and available for the undergraduates. How do we think about active learning in lecture contexts? Okay, citation and predictive text gives them peer entries. We're drawing on the fact that there's 150 people in the classroom now. And that 150 of them can do way more data entry than only three. 
We're asking them for citations, again, so that they have that back channel. This is a historic, historian's practice. We call it historiography, which is the conversation historians have with each other about whether or not we agree or disagree about change and continuity. They're suddenly engaging in that. Murdered on the orders of Narcissus for adultery. In the logs, we have an example of students changing this description because the previous students who did the data entry didn't do it well enough. And they added up here, in the midst of an adulterous affair, Messalina. So this is fantastic work, right? It's not totally a 100% worded the way that an academic writer would write it, but it's really thoughtful analysis. And that's what we were trying to push. We wanted that interpretive stuff that didn't come out of just the data entry. We wanted to move them past basic ideas. But we also know that different people come into the classroom with different skill sets. So one of the things that we analyzed in a, a very recent um, IJCSCL article was how this supported students at different levels. So we, um, I, I talked about the paper and analysis and the grading. We looked at high-performing student groups based on the, the end results of their output, the paper, and low-performing student groups. And we analyzed a set. This is a low-performing student group. Each one of these little arrows here is an activity. So the arrow changes as they change tasks. These are nodes and edges that they're interested in. So here they're clicking around and looking at basic identification. Who the heck are these people? There are a lot of names here. That's essentially what this says the students are doing. I need to know if I can edit this. So there's a little pencil that says they edited something. They edited two things very quickly in a row here. But they're just sort of surfing through the barrage of data, trying to get a handle on what's in it. At the same time, though, isn't that what we want for students who are first encountering a text? So this isn't a bad outcome. It's just an indication of their level of understanding of what's happening in the text and an indication that the, that the net create activities and software systems actually supported that reasonably well. Okay, but here's a high performing group. Many fewer task changes, many fewer moves in this excerpt. Much more discussion of what this means. Discuss how network intensity is shown in the visualization. Ask instructors how to add multiple citations to an edge. This is, student, this is a student group that's high performing, trying to figure out how to tie a single action, a single interaction between two people to multiple places in a text. Okay, that's pretty cool. Discussing evidence from the text that explains why. Argumentation with causality. So this high-performing group and this low-performing group do this at ex almost exactly the same time in the same day. And we supported it with the same activity system and the same software package. So what this also does for us in a large lecture classroom is support many different skill levels, which lectures don't do. Lectures assume baseline students, average, all doing the same thing. This assumes very different skill sets and supports that pushes each group of students from their current skill level into the next skill level, regardless of what that skill level is, with a little bit of contingent support from the professor. Exactly what we need in a large lecture classroom to get students to actively participate in the construction of history, rather than just sit and have it given to them like data. Results. Okay. Students who were the most successful at reconstructing historical contexts in their final paper belonged to groups whose activities were more focused on CAPTA, pulling and, and, and assessing information from the network and explaining why it was significant. One might be surprised from the student paper that Agrippina's edge with Claudius is not thicker. Claudius is her fourth, or uh, she's Claudius's fourth husband, wife, there we go. However, her note has no direct connection to the Senate. Now we are getting into Roman Republic politics and how that changes in the imperial world. Agrippina's closest connection with the Senate might be Alidia Severus, who campaigned for marriage between an uncle and a niece simply to pursue his romantic interests with her. Causality? How does the Roman imperial world work? How do women fit into it? This suggests argumentation language here that while her influence was strong as she grew to be dominant in the imperial household, women's, uh, women's places in home, she may have had less direct influence in the Senate. This is what we want students to do. All right. Um, the, all, the other thing I will note is that the history instructor approved this. Many students who are uncomfortable making assertions about text, who are mid-level students, were more comfortable after, after this activity, not just with this text, but with all of the other texts. 
given them a toolkit that they use the rest of the semester, according to the instructor's anecdotal read on how his students performed that semester. All right, well, now here's the fun part. All of it, are they're all fun. That same instructor, as we were working with the network that I showed you, asked if we could recolor the, the, the nodes that are labeled people and turn them into men and women because he saw something that I didn't. Again, me not being an expert in any of the things I'm talking about, but knowing how to tie them together, he saw something I didn't. And he saw something I didn't because of what the students did with it. He saw women playing a role as power brokers, not big nodes, but connecting big nodes. Agrippina is a good example. And so he asked if maybe we could do this and write a research paper using NetCreate. So first, we're bringing a learning experience into a research practice for a historian, which is normally not the case. But second, we actually began to use some of the practices that we had developed for the activity system for our students in our own work. We took three to five pages with one of the undergraduates who was in the original classroom that did this network. She's helping us as our CAPTA entry person. We're looking at the analysis and we are redoing the types of nodes and edges we're using. We're redoing the taxonomy. We gave students taxonomies of men, women, events, places. We needed to redo that. And so what we did was take three to five pages, different pages from Tacitus. We each read them. We each developed our own taxonomy. And then we talked about the taxonomy that came from our pages. It's very much like the net create activity we had students do. We're doing it with taxonomy in mind instead of node edge extraction in mind and it worked. We were able to simplify the structure of the nodes and edges we're tracking in our research project. We did this about th three, four weeks ago, so the timing on this talk is great. Um, in a separate research project with one of the other NetCreate GAs, we did something very similar. We negotiated our nodes and edges, the nodes we took in on the citational practices we had on a text from the late eighth century in Ravenna, Italy, to try and figure out what one of the authors we were working with found was important and realized that what he really is is a tour guide. And it was the citational practices in NetCreate, the simultaneous visualization that allowed us to work at the same time remotely, the negotiative structure that the citation access gave us and the note taking that we could do tied to all of those things that let us make good research decisions. So this is where researchers as learners is an unexpected end result. This is not where I thought we would be in you know, 2015 or 2016 when I, when I first used Google Forms. Thinking about researchers as learners and participating in the same activity system with a few changes has been a real eye-opener for me, um, and, and in the best possible way. Um, so I'm gonna jump here to activity theory as infrastructure. This is what I really want to think about. How many, how many triangles have I put up now? Um, the, the world of the researcher is to publish. But it's often very difficult to think about how to manage that in a single author, single monograph, discipline like history where we don't work collaboratively. And one of the things that NetCreate has given us the ability to do is build broad research expertise across many people in a collaborative team at many different levels. We're supporting an undergraduate someone who doesn't do network analysis but knows Tacitus, and someone who knows ta network analysis but not Tacitus. All three of us are using the same platform, and this will build all of our research expertise. We're learning from this and not just doing research. I think that's the really key uh, part of this whole thing for me, um, is that this is the kind of collaborative structure that makes us learning scientists. And I'm gonna use us here because this is my community. Here's me in the middle, but you can see all of the different people in Query and the folks who, who built the, the NetCreate version of the software, all of the learning sciences folks who have collaborated on this in its various stages, the people at IDA who have helped support NetCreate in other classroom activities and on which we've tested this activity system outside the classroom, the people at um, in the history department, the folks in the Center for Research on Race, Race Ethnicity, and Society who have also used NetCreate for very different purposes. This is the kind of research community that makes this kind of interdisciplinary work function and function well. And it's the activity system that's given me the sort of structure to impose on it so that I understand how it works and can develop it in the future. And on that note, I am done. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, we've got, actually, you're, you're slightly ahead of schedule, so we've got 20 minutes for questions if anybody has them. And, 
Uh, folks in Zoom, if you want to type them in the chat, I can forward them. Um, I can see the chat on my window here, so I just need to figure out where it went. Thank you, Megan. Um, where did it go? It's up on the projection. Okay, hold on. Let me see if I can find it. This is the problem I always have working with two screens. Sorry, my mouse. I'm turning the chat off. Yes, literally all the years. Thank you, Suraj, for noting that. Um, hang on just a second. So there's some uh, there's some Easter eggs in here. You know, how many of you found them? Um, one. Avocado. Yeah, literally <laughs> all the years. I'm going to go back to uh, that slide so that I can show Suraj. Here we go. Danish and rap lab, literally all the years. Uh, I'm, this is really serious. Like uh, this, this kind of interdisciplinary work is is hard to do. Okay, so questions. Uh, since I can't see the chat, Josh will have to moderate. Uh, Suraj wants more triangles. More triangles, um, <laughs> like of the of the network analysis kind or of the activity theory kind. I'm sure the second. Okay, well, I can do that. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Yes, I I would ha I'd be happy to release Taylor's cut. No questions. More questions. Um, you talked a bit about how uh, like mid performing versus high performing student groups sort of engage with the tool okay. differently, and like what their processes look like. How did the? I'm, I'm curious what the practice how the practices differed between mid-performing, high-performing, and then experts mm. using the tool, and like researchers using the tool? So researchers using the tool, we don't have as much data on it because that's new-ish, and sure. we're not logging them quite so big brother-y. Yeah. Um, Fair. But um, having, yeah, no, I mean, having looked at some of the high, so, well, so let me, let me take one step backward and talk about day one and day two. Sure. Um, what we saw was from day one, I think. Hang on. Make sure I put it right. Um, this is day one. So this is our first encounter. What we saw uniformly, regardless of the group level, is that their day two performance bumped up in terms of lengthier, episodic exploration of one thing and discussion. So the, on, on day two, this group's timeline of interaction would not have been quite so fully integrated as this group's. This is day one again. But it was much, much, much more like what we would expect to see from an expert. And on day two, our high groups came much closer to talking about the networks in ways that are recognizable to me having conversations with my peers. Um, again, the, I think the vocabulary is more different than the behavior, if I were to, to put a pin on it, um, that, that we have more structured vocabulary around disciplinary norms that gets applied in these kinds of instances. But that the inner the interaction with the tools, if we were to map it like this, is going to look more like an expert than less. Um, to say no, that this it, pattern of longer episodes with longer episodes with conversations, continue. right? So what they're doing here, um, I'm going to close the chat. There we go. I found my mouse. Okay. So what what they're doing here is. Stay on this side. These are exploratory. What are we looking at? Who is connected? We're adding an edge. Then they're going back to what we just looked at. So this is referential. Then we're going to edit the thing that we just added an edge to because now we've done some revision, not just because another group told us something about it that we disagree with, but because our conversation moved our understanding of this noted edge interactional pair forward. And so that's what we're seeing as we move through these is that they're moving. So this is all Messalina and Narcissus, um, two people who, who have a sort of um, murder plot going. Um, this is basically like the Shonda Rhimes version of the late Roman imperial world um, because the late Roman imperial world was sort of like how to get away with murder. Um, and, and thinking through the ways in which they are questioning their work, going back to what they just did and saying, did we do that right? I think is really um, valuable as a practice and is what we expect experts to do. You don't just say something once and then move on. You look at it and you iterate. And that's what they are doing here in this excerpt. This might be just based on observation. I like would 
people with PhDs be less willing to go back and revise former understandings as like as students or I, I sort of see this pattern of them realizing like, oh, my understanding wasn't as nuanced as it is now. Mm -hmm. Let's go back and revise. Is that not what reviewer two is for? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the, the answer is yes, absolutely. And that's, I think that that's one of the things that we're seeing with this research project, right? Colin and I have been talking about this network analysis research project since spring of 2018. Obviously, there were some interstitial issues that got in the way of us doing it. And so we were just now starting it in the ways that we really wanted to. Um, and, and, and what I'm seeing from him um, and, and what I'm feeling, because we're coming at this from two different sets of expertise, is that we're both willing to go back and revise. I was part of the taxonomic discussion that we just had, that we use the net create activity system to support, like, how do we do this in a way that we can both bring our ideas to the table, but make those ideas visible and have a conversation that is rooted in historical disciplinary norms and network norms so that we can move forward with a, with a revised network structure that does what that answers the question we want to answer, which is how effective, how effective are the ties that women in the Roman imperial world um, build in order to hold generational power together? Because Tacitus doesn't write about the women. He hates women. Women poison people, women have affairs, and women murder people, and otherwise they are not helpful. So he doesn't talk about them unless they're doing one of those things. Um, and that's a very, very warped view, right? Yes. <laughs> sort of typical of the Roman imperial world. But how do we get at what the women are doing by using this tool that helps us uncover their connections and their power brokering? Where are the implicit ties? And that's where, like, we had to revise our understanding of it. So I think we're, we're sort of pre prefiguring reviewer number two is going to go, you used what to understand the Roman imperial world? So that we can make that argument with, with all of these revisions in mind already. Thank you. Lena and then Joshua. So, um, I have a question about this. Uh, yeah. How did you generate this? Um, yeah, so um, that's manually you. because your colleague Megan is super awesome and amazing. Um, so one of the things that we were trying to do was represent the richness of their interaction with the tool and with each other. Transcripts just transcripts didn't do it. It didn't communicate the log files that we were pulling from because we have logs of the data. So we've got timestamps from video data. We've got log interactions. We've got what they did to the log. We've got their talk. Um, and um, and because we rooted it all in interaction analysis, we really needed a way to represent how all of those things fit together. And this was Megan's idea. Um, and then uh, she did it in um, Word Smart Art, hated Word Smart Art with passion, as is, is right. Um, and, then we put, and then we put it together in uh, Illustrator. So we used manual structures. Um, you can see that it does, in fact, have a timeline. So these are yeah. relatively... Um, reasonable minute timestamps like you could actually like watch the video and say yes this is proportionally how long they spent talking about this versus doing the entry um uh, and we worked together to make it pretty so that it was visible we talked about a number of different ways to represent adding nodes representing adding edges so that it maps to the the visualization structures that are in the network analysis tool this was something that took us a while to figure out we're trying to figure out how to use common revision representation. So like this itself was a study in how you represent things. Yeah. Um, but but ultimately it became the foundation for us to talk about what the students were doing and understand it better. So it was both helpful as something that we could put as a figure into the article that is in IJCSCL, but also valuable for us as a research team in terms of thinking about what we were seeing. So those the ones that are like the log file and you kind of triangulate it with the video data with the timestamps yep. um, to create this. Oh. Uh, so I'm just passing along two questions from the chat. Uh, the first was Cindy asking if you have any thoughts on how to scaffold the lower performing groups to look more like the higher performing groups. Um, yeah, yes. And I think that the answer is in repeated visitations to the text. Because I don't think that you can train what a historian would call reading comprehension in full um, in 275 minute sessions. It's really valuable to get students into the text. Like, well, essentially what we're doing is training notational and, and um, information extraction techniques the way that a historian would, but that takes repetition. You can't just do it in one minute. So um, one of the studies I did not talk about, what we were interested in how history thinking helps support network science understanding. This is all network science in support of history. 
we had a small class of about 20 people who engaged with network analysis over the course of eight weeks. They used network analysis to tie together, they chose the taxonomy themselves. They used network analysis to tie together objects that we collected from the public and did digital simulacra of for a history harvest, a sort of collection of, of archival materials that might not make it into the historical record. And then I asked them to do a historical analysis of it using the digital methods tool of their choice. And when we analyzed the folks who chose networks. And what I would suggest is that the repeated encounters that they had with objects think through the taxonomy that they wanted to apply to the objects. One group chose the, the object's place of origin, the culture from which it came, and its location in a person's life as a, a, a way of, of understanding the global influence of um, different kinds of cultures on the IU community itself. And they had to do that over eight weeks, so they kept coming back to it, reading the objects again and again and again, um, and adjusting their understanding of the objects in the network. And I think if we were to do that with a single text across the whole semester, so that they get the intro in the activity system to the text the first time, and then we come back to it, and we ask them different questions about what's in the network as we move through different phases of history. But this would require like a really, really narrow focused, like a class all about Nero's Rome to do, to allow for that kind of return to the network. And I think that that's where um, like if I were to design a class from the ground up to support this kind of network thinking, it would be one text. And we would look at all of the different texts that are written um, around the same time as that text and apply network thinking to all of them so that we could bring students from um, a sort of first encounter low performance into the world of, oh, I understand why this is important and how this helps me see not just this one text, but all of these related texts and their historical context. Um, so, I mean, that's that's not a single study, though, right? And that's not an easy thing to do, uh, but I think that would be the necessary thing. We had a second question? Uh, you answered Zach's question, which was what it would look like to use this tool with something that wasn't text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can actually show you that. Um, there go. Uh, I can show you the network that we built here. Um, it's in a student generated um, exhibit that uh, turned into a connection uh, between different objects in the community. Uh, this is great. So this was, these were, there were two network groups. They both developed very different taxonomies. One group um, pre-imposed a set of relationships on the objects that we collected uh, based on three or four sample objects and then produced a network where they were really controlling all of the data very carefully. And this is that network. Um, it looks at place here. Um, it looks at the communities of practice to which a particular artifact was tied. In this case, it's a Grateful Dead hat. So it's tied to fandom communities. It's tied to the Grateful Dead. It's tied to music culture. Um, and then they explored um, the ways in which these different cultures and different objects might tie together. So this is very triangular. Um, Suraj wanted more triangles. This is all triangles because of the data structure that they imposed. But if you look at what their colleagues did, which they were more interested in um, what is connected to something else. So they just said they have one edge type, is connected to. Um, and, and then they just sort of talked to each other as they developed taxonomies that and realized that what they were looking at was the tension between individual expression. So an object like a Grateful Dead hat is something someone chooses to talk about who they are without talking about who they are. But that's also a culturally imposed value. Like the Grateful Dead brings with it a whole bunch of connotations that shape what we think of you when we see you in that hat. And so they, that, that was eventually what they explored in their narrative was the tension between what individual objects do as individual expression and how the cultural norms and contexts that produced that individual object, uh, push back on individual expression and make it part of a sort of community of practice. Another question. So several times now you've mentioned, you know, vocabulary, mm -hmm. going back to that, uh, taxonomy. So from a historical perspective, can you elaborate more on what is meant by taxonomy? Uh, so taxonomy, the categorization of things into buckets, right? <laughs> um, historians don't call it that. We call it the categorization of things into buckets. Um, but 
one of my goals, especially for this class, this was a 16 week class on digital methods. Um, I wanted students to be able to move between those worlds so that they could say, well, as a historian, I put things into buckets. As a data scientist, I create taxonomies. And to be able to explain it in those terms. Um, so the, and, and there are historians who have access to that kind of language without being digital historians. Um, we, would, we would talk about social history and putting people into socioeconomic classes. So classification might be a better vocabulary term for historians than taxonomy, but I like taxonomy because it is a, it, it brings us back to that CAPTA question. Classifications sometimes assumes existing stuff and you put people into buckets that somebody else built. Taxonomy is the development of a, of a classification system. And, and so for me, the, the use of that word helps me remember that we're building something, not taking something. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Okay, I think you might have covered a little bit. So you have 12 uh, groups for these studies. So how do you select like the high performing group? Because I feel, I don't, and there are 25 um, mm -hmm. like networks there. So how do you decide which is the best? And I think only looking for the, the nodes, edges, that's not enough, but also the accuracy of something else. Yeah. So, what so I'll go back to the methods piece here. Let's see if I can do this. Let's see. Um, the methods piece. Okay, so that's where we pulled on several different things. So we've got a lot of different data that is written. The instructor who worked with us was so amazing. He was like, tell me what to assign. What will help you? So we asked a traditional historical paper question. How important is Agrippina? She's the, one of the women who plays a big role in this, unlike many of the other women in the network. How important is Agrippina to the events of Nero's reign? And how do you know? That's a history question. It's so broad. It's really big. And we wanted to see where they went with it. We wanted to know how often they incorporated network vocabulary terms without being prompted really. Like we, we talked about centrality, the importance of something in a network that's big and as a, as a way of understanding significance for history and centrality for network analysis. So we used how important, sort of avoid both of those terms to see what they would pull in. Um, and so the, the research team evaluated network analysis terms. And then the teaching team graded the papers based on historical, significance and the evidence students brought to bear in answering that question. We combined the grades um, and averaged them for each student in each group so that we could look at which groups had the highest performing students on both measures. And that's, and then we ranked them. <coughs> and then we chose a group that was way up here where we could hear the video and where, you know, there were, it was, it was um, good data. Same thing for the low groups, and, and that gave us the ability to think about their output at the end and what they had learned as a measure of what the tool had done for them. We also did look at grades coming in. So we did have a basic understanding of which students were higher or low performing, according to the instructor prior to doing that. Um, we ended up not needing to do much pre-existing grade norming because they mostly fell into those categories. So in a lot of cases, what we're looking at are good students versus less good students. And I think it's really valuable to note that we can't just support the good students and that the tool, those, this low performing group that I pointed out actually did stuff. That, that one group in the pilot study said, oh, I don't want to do anything. And then did stuff. We see that pattern that I don't want to do anything in all of the studies. We've got at least one group that says, I don't want to input anything new. Let's find something that's there. And then they go on to do some really great work that starts from a place of laziness. And that's what we want to support, really. Awesome. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you everyone for joining us in person online. Uh, does anyone want to remind you all that we will be back again in February with Leanne uh, Deleuze of CS for All. And uh, for those of you who are here in person, please join us for lunch and uh, asking more questions with Kalani. Or not. For the lunch part, for sure. uh, so thank you again, and see you all shortly. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay. 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 Okay.